Hello, hello, everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time of day it is um, that you're watching. My name is Ashia, and I am delighted, delighted to be in conversation with um, Nandana. Um, <clears throat> I have to say I got a little bit teary um, watching that video because um, I'm somebody who's had the opportunity to meet uh, Novolita. Um, on several occasions and over, I realized the other day, over like 20 or 25 years. Um, those pictures are beautiful because the, what you never forget about Navonita is her vivacity. And those pictures are just radiating with her energy and her spirit and her life force. And of course, her great big laugh. You never forget Nobonita's laugh if you've, um, if you've heard her. And she laughed a lot, so that's good. Most people have um, <laughs> heard her laugh. Um, I also wanted to say something a little bit personal. Um, I know Nandana and Antara both are Nobonita's daughters, and they are very delicate, very precious, very um, supportive and committed friendships, even though we don't actually see each other as much as we would like. Um, and I also, um, I feel this is this is uh, a legacy for me, the friendship with, um, Nobuni, uh, with um, Nandana and Antara, uh, because my guru ma, Wendy Doniger, was very, very good friends with uh, Nobunita and with your father. So I feel that this is a second generation friendship. Um, and whether it's Wendy and your mother or whether it's the three of us, I know that the bonds of these friendships really are both affection um, and admiration, you know, and that, that is rare. So, hello, dear Nandana, and let us um, enjoy your beautiful, beautiful uh, book together uh, this evening. It's called um, Acrobat. It's published by Jagannath. Thank you, Chiki, for making such a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, Ashia, I have to say that I'm, I'm so grateful to you for doing this oh, with me. It is such a special hour in my life. Um, I know how close you and Ma were. And it's, it's, it's funny that both of us started out this hour with tears, but I'm glad that you brought our attention back to my mother's yeah. love and laughter and joy. Um, and, you know, you two had such a close not just a close friendship, but you were such kindred spirits in so many ways. There were so many intersections in what you uh, are both passionate about. And I have admired your translations, your books, your uh, activism, uh, your linguistic activism, the work you've done for children um, for so many years. There are just all kinds of reasons why this, this uh, morning for me and evening in India is um, very auspicious. So thank you so much for making the time and a huge thank you to the Asia Society for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Nandana, but we're here to talk about you and Nobunita. Um, you know, Nobunita was so many things, not simply so many things to so many people, as people love to say, but she was so many things within her, to herself. I mean, of course, we remember her as a poet mainly, but um, she wrote in many kinds of Bangla. She wrote novels, she wrote short stories, she wrote essays, she translated into Bangla. Um, she was a scholar. She worked on Ramana at Harvard um, in the 1960s. Um, Sadly, her work is kind of hard to find the early work, but I realized how much of what she did set the way for women scholars like myself who work on Ramayana. Um, so we have much, much, much um, to, uh, to remember her for. Um, and also, of course, um, I think very importantly, she was a feminist, you know, um, and that was a very, very interesting generation of middle-class Indian women who were, who, who were keeping so many balls in the air, their sense of self, their scholarship, their families, their daughters, right? Um, and we forget that because we see her great successes, 
you know, and she, God knows she has many, God bless her. Um, but, um, uh, and I think that generation of feminists were very, very good at hiding their struggles and their challenges because it was so important to be strong um, and to, to be able to do all of these things. Um, but let's, let's, let's um, start um, with one of the things that interests me particu particularly is her commitment to Bangla, to writing in Bangla, to translating into Bangla. Um, but she was a bloody good poet in English too. She was. Yeah. So um, I'm going to ask you, Nandana, to read The Last Gust, right? mm. so we get a sense of um, how she wrote in English, a poem that she wrote in English, and then perhaps you can tell us more about her linguistic activism and her commitment to, to Bangla language. I'd, I'd love I'd love that. I'm so glad you chose this poem. Thank you again for curating the poems oh, that we're going to share with the audience today. Um, the Last Gust. Spreading out upon the floor, <clears throat> we warm our limbs under red cross blankets, huddled up against bodies unfamiliar but warmth giving. We shiver in the hailstorm like stray kittens. We dream of rippling yellow paddy fields, the lake mirroring brass pitchers made golden on narrow waists and proud heads by an admiring sun. Cringing, we hide our scars under strange pubic hair. We dream of laughing brown faces thrown skywards in careless abandon, bearing white ivory upon polished mahogany. Clinging to unfamiliar bodies under donated blankets, we wait for the last gust of wind to snatch the thatched roof away. So, you know what's, um, there's an interesting story about this poem, which is that she translated it uh, into Bangla, um, <clears throat> calling it Sheet Jhar uh, Unishu uh, Winter Storm, 1971. And I actually had a, tra I was going to include a, I didn't realize that she had written this poem originally in English. Um, so I was going to include a translation from the Bengali version in this book. And then I discovered that this had actually been published um, in, I think, 1972 in Hyperion. Uh, and it's a slightly different version, uh, really, of course, strong. Um, and it was, she wrote it at a time, this, as you can tell, is a poem about displacement. And she wrote it at a time when... Um, her marriage was falling apart. She was uh, making a big decision to come back home. And um, this sense of being disoriented and um, vulnerable is so strong in this poem. But um, it was also interesting that she made choices when she did the Bengali version of, uh, it's not a literal translation, but she re, uh, rewrote it for Bangla. Um, you know, Ma was, like you, uh, very much a language activist. I mean, you were both, you are both feminists and, and, and translators and classicists. There are so many intersections in your interests. Um, but she was, when she came back to India, she made the choice to write all of her creative work in Bangla, her academic work. Of course, she continued writing in English. Um, and she did that for a number of reasons. First um, was her anxiety about the fact that regional literatures and languages in India were at risk of seeming to be obsolete. Um, she was very worried that the younger generation, especially the urban youth, uh, was getting increasingly disconnected from their mother tongues. And she was also, that was one part of it. And she felt that... Uh, it was her responsibility to write in, uh, in, in Bangla. Um, she was worried about uh, a multilingual, um, in, incredibly rich tradition uh, becoming, uh, shrinking increasingly in India. And the other thing that she actually anticipated um, before it became a movement, uh, was the fact that 
there would be a huge explosion of Indian writing in English. And while she loved, she was a great admirer of, she was, she was a very voracious reader and she loved um, writing, uh, reading uh, Indian writing in English, she anticipated that increasingly Indian literature would be rep represented to the world through uh, books that were being written in English by wonderful writers of Indian origin who lived away from India. And she felt that that would be a misrepresentation of the um, intricate uh, and multilingual literary face of India to the world. So that was another reason why she felt very strongly about writing in Bangla. Um, I'll just end with this uh, answer with one thing that I always found very interesting. When she, around this time, she wrote about this in a book called Probashe Doi Ber Boshe, um, In a Foreign Land by Chance is the English title of it, where the protagonist is a Bengali poet who moves to England from Calcutta and decides to write only in English to be accepted in the world. And exactly at the same time, my mother did just the reverse. She moved from England to India and decided never, in fact, to write uh, poetry in English again. It's a pretty courageous decision, you know, precisely because of the way um, the colonial world functions, that you become a global person when you write in a global language. Um, and sadly, I mean, I wish I could say things have changed in the 50 years since she thought this, um, that, we, that we would be getting stronger younger generations in our regional languages, but <clears throat> ain't happened yet. Um, no, but, but because of people... Uh, writers and scholars and activists like you, at least there is, because the other thing that she was really worried about was the fact that our uh, regional literatures were not being adequately translated. Um, there were not, not enough of the, our wonderful books were being translated. When they were translated, they were not translated well enough. Yeah. When they were translated well, they were not available. But because of people like you, and there has been a movement where I think at least that is in a much stronger place now than it was when she made that decision, don't you think? I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. And again, you know, I mean, this movement is possible or the kind of thing that me and so many other people do. It's possible because we're standing on our shoulders, not only hers, but on, you know, of so many who did so much for us to be able to, um, to take it further. This return to Calcutta um, after being in England, uh, obviously a, a, a very sad and perhaps a traumatic return. Will you read Return of the Dead, which I think is really a love poem to her roots. It's on page 126. Great. <clears throat> Receive me then, Kolkata. I am your true love, your whole world. I'm back from the war, an aborted mother. I have brought the ocean with me instead. My lap is empty, yes, but my breasts are heavy overflowing with wasted milk. Look at the fathomless salt water in my eyes. Come then, look at me. See how virginity burns on my brow again, fiery as the setting sun. Touch me, for my newborn flesh belongs to you now. Receive me then, Kolkata, in your waiting arms. Your loneliness is over at last. I have returned just as you had wanted me to. Why this stunned silence then, this anxious glance, these days? Lift your face, don't shift your eyes, look at me. Your prayers were heard. Here I am returned from the dead. Yes, it's me, your childhood sweetheart, your world of passion, your old flame, your very own. No, Bonita. I gotta say, I love those last two lines. Yeah, no. said, your very own Nobunita. Um, yeah, it's very I love reading this poem actually in Bangla always. Um, she, this was a poem that she just was probably the one poem that she um, would always read at um, any Kobi Shamelon or any poetry meet. So yes, it is indeed a love poem. Um, to her city, but I think it's also a poem um, about 
a kind of um, betrayal that she felt, um, which I think uh, she she was she was so resilient and she was such a survivor. She um, found her way back into that world very quickly through her poetry, through her personality. Um, but you know, when she had left India, she had left at, as this incredibly glamorous young person who was a brilliant student about to go off to Harvard, who was uh, engaged to someone who was on the brink of uh, stardom, academic stardom. She was a published poet. Her first book had already come out, great reviews. She was an incredibly talented visual artist. She had exhibitions of her art. She was also extremely attractive and had uh, was, was very popular um, in the literary, cultural, artistic scene. And when she decided to leave, it was as a, the, the whole uh, city was kind of heartbroken to leave, to, to lose um, this magnetic young person who was such a life force. And yet when she came back, she came, although her literary, uh, her sort of social circle was very progressive, of course, no one really knew uh, closely anybody who was getting divorced. So, uh, this world that she had always accepted as as her own didn't quite know how to fit her, how to, how to um, how she it took her a while to find her place in it again, and she was met with a kind of awkwardness, and that I think is also something a a a, a vul that uh, vulnerability that disappointment um, is also something that you feel so strongly in this poem. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's a it's a poem that is deeply anguished, but it's also so defiant, you know, and um, I can I think it's I can just imagine Nobunita reading this over and over again in public places in Kolkata, yes. saying, you know what, this is what you did to me, but I am your own Nobunita. It's, exactly. it's, and, yeah. <laughs> and she would always actually get teary when she read this poem. I mean, every every single time, no matter how many times she she yeah. read it she just lived it uh yeah. she lived it every time she read it um and you're right it was she loved kolkata uh it was such a visceral and kind of unconditional and limitless love that she had for the city yeah let's talk a little bit about how she writes about poetry, you know, the self-reflexivity of the poet writing about a poem. Um, <laughs> because she says, you know, in your wonderful, wonderful introduction, um, you quote her saying that uh, poetry empowers her. She sees herself on the page. Women find freedom um, in, in poetry. And she's, you know, obviously uh, she's written a lot about um, how to write a poem, or not how to, I mean, what happens when you write a poem, she addresses poems, she thinks of herself as a poet, but my, actually, my favorite one is Heartbeat. Yeah? So on yeah. page 33. Yeah. Because it shows a visceral connection, you know, the, yeah. Yes, I love it. The meaning of the word heartbeat changed for her suddenly that day just as the tiny bluebell bursts through deep snow for the first time, all alone, so brave. Just as the sliver of light falls on one side of the face, glowing like a fond memory. Words are flighty. Like fortune's goddess, they flit from home to home, changing their character and their heart. The face of the word heartbeat suddenly hardened, like a cunning moneylender appearing at the door, clutching the deed of debts accrued since birth. And so, signing the bond of her lifetime, this free woman became a slave to one word, heartbeat. You comment on that image of the cunning moneylender in your introduction. Do you want to tell us what you said? I think, um, you know, she, uh, she, it, she had a very, um, 
as you said, visceral but fraught relationship with um, with with writing, with language. And she, while she saw, um, she often wrote that she was both blessed and cursed by poetry, um, that she couldn't have survived without poetry, but it uh, was also um, uh, that she also felt uh that she that she in some ways was also traumatized by it and i think she um was extremely aware of um the unreliability of language and also the violence that lurks in language um so while she felt that it was a tool for survival and empowerment she also felt that it was um it could be a weapon it could uh it could hurt you it had to be I think more, this poem, I mean, there are various aspects of um, this, co- the complexity that she felt uh, in her relationship with language that uh, come out in different poems. And this one, I think you can uh, see that she um, feels that it's, it's kind of combined with her um, sense of accountability as a, as, as a mother. I think and this word accountability is something that was very important to her as a poet, as a writer. She felt very extremely, she felt accountable for every word that she wrote. And this, this poem is so beautiful because it's also um, uh, merged with the accountability she feels when you take responsibility for a life. And I think for her, writing was like uh, creating, was, was like creating life. Um, and taking responsibility for it, bringing a poem into the world in the way that you bring a child into the world and a world that could be quite unforgiving, quite exacting, uh, quite brutal, and negotiating that relationship through language. Yeah, I I imagine that um, many poets have a fraught relationship with language, you know, the the tool, as it were, of their art and their passion. but it's rare when you see a poet um, melancholic about mm-hmm. language. And I think that's what she is in a sad song about words. Mm. Um, I, I really love that poem actually. And it's um, one of, somehow this is not a poem that has been uh, read or shared very much in either. Oh, really? Which, um, yeah, it's called High Shop though in Bangla, and it's um, it, it is one of my favorites. A sad song about words. They refuse to be at your beck and call, like God's grace. They need an auspicious moment, the right mood, or at least a whim. Words stand aloof like the false modesty, many hued, of a setting sun that leans against the sky unattached, unreachable, alone, yet gently touching the earth's tamed mane like with caressing fingers. Like the framed image of a perfect couple lighting up the storefront of a photo studio, a staged scene between two strangers who don't remember each other's faces but are bound by a pose mm. and by cash, models of a charmed moment. So too, words linger and dazzle the waiting peaks of your brain, like the pink rays of a setting of a fading sun. If you lock eyes, there may be an instant celebration, but that's all. Don't think for a moment that words will ever melt the ice or warm you enough to draw you close. No, never. Like landed gentry, flawlessly attired, words step gingerly into the grand carriage of your imagination, avoiding the muddy pavement of your pen. Yeah. She's got great punch in her last lines. I remember this, the muddy pavement of your pen. I mean, it's, it's an image. It's, it's, it's a really, really strong. Why do you think, uh, Nandana, that this was um, not one of her more widely read um, poems? Um, 
I don't know. I've wondered about that myself. I mean, it is about the elusiveness of language, isn't it? It's about how yeah. about the slipperiness of language and about the helplessness that she feels as a writer and perhaps um, uh, her audience love to read poetry, which were poems that were celebrating her uh her might rather than her helplessness. I'm not sure. No, that's, uh, that's it's a complex, you know, you know, but it's also a complex idea. It's, um, it is, it is, a, you see her frustration as a writer. It's a kind of condemnation of her, uh, her tool as an artist, isn't it? Very, so it's, very much, yeah. it's a very, it's a complex poem, poem and, and maybe the complexity had something to do with um, why it wasn't shared as much as some of her other poetry, which perhaps uh, were more immediate in some ways. But yeah, um, yeah. What, also, how do, what do you think? Yeah. What do you think? How, I, how? I love it. I mean, I think I think you're absolutely right that it's the the vulnerability um, mm -hmm. that people don't want to deal with because um, I think one of the the prices that she paid for her charisma um, mm -hmm. is that people wanted her to be what they wanted her to be. That's so know? true. So That's they, I, I want to hear a poem like this from Nobunita. Why is she doing like that? You know, I mean, she, uh, I don't want to talk to you about, um, you know, you say in your, in your introduction that um, much of her prose, apart from her novels, um, was in writing about her real life, her, her life as a single woman parent with two growing daughters, um, feisty as hell, just like their mother. Um, and, you know, Kolkata's curiosity about this creature, right? And, and I think that, you know, the fact that she wrote about her life um, in prose, um, it's a way of owning the intrusion and the curiosity and the, you know, the violation of her privacy. But what was it like for you two growing up, um, you know, knowing that uh, this, is a, this is a fully female household, um, you know, and everybody's just looking, waiting for you to fall or for some scandal to erupt, you know? Um, was it possible? You know, it's, a, I think we were, I mean, there were a number of aspects to this, right? Like one thing was that we kind of grew up, yes, it was an all female family. It was this old, beautiful house that my mother grew up in. It was, belong, it was clearly a poet's house because my mother's parents were poets as well. It was full of books. I mean, we kept getting driven out of rooms because it would f they, each room would fill up with books and there would be no space for it. And then we would move to another room. It was that kind of a house. Um, but we, I think because we, it was an all female family, there were a couple of things that happened. One is that it never occurred to us that um, they were, that our uh, identity as girls could in any way be an impediment to anything that we wanted to do. But the other thing that that also came along with that is that both our mother, uh, both my uh, our mother and our grandmother were very strong women. They were writers, they were artists, they were feminists, and we could certainly see their struggles. Uh, so we kind of also grew up with understanding fully uh, that there was a responsibility that, that, that uh, being female was a complicated responsibility uh, and, and a struggle in some ways. But that was different from thinking that there was there were limits to what we could do. I think in terms of the, the other side of it was we took writing and books and um, words for granted because there was so much of it around us. And, you know, we were a kind of obsessively writerly family. My mother and my grandmother kept writing letters between Dotola, Tintola, you know, there were letters flying upstairs and downstairs all day long. We would write poems to each other on our birthdays when I left for um, Harvard, my grandmother gave me, which I still have this really beautiful uh, notebook, hand, uh, handmade notebook uh, with handmade paper, which where she filled every page with a note or a poem for me to have uh, because she knew how much I would be missing 
her and Ma and Didi and the house. And um, my mother kept right, you know, would write to me constantly and send poetry to me and write, you know, long aerograms where every every bit of you know blue space would be scribbled in the corners here and there you'd have to piece, piece it all together like a jigsaw puzzle so there was and a lot of it was poetry so there was you know we kind of made sense without really realizing it we sort of made sense of life through poetry in our in our home which was quite beautiful now that I look at it I see how unique that was but growing up steeped in poetry it didn't seem like that um, and then the, the third part of it is the fact that she had also grown up as a child of celebrity parents. Um, our house was always open. Uh, it was a place for, for literary meets, for, um, for concerts, for, you know, poetry readings. And uh, she was so beloved. We kind of grew up with her uh, really enjoying how adored she was and how our daughter, our grandmother was too. So uh, I think we were really, we, we loved it. We were really proud of it. Uh, that said, um, I have to be honest and say that, you know, I decided as a very young person that I needed to go away to study to a place where my parents, where I would be seen as, where I wouldn't immediately be identified as the child of, my parents and the and the and the grandchild of my grandparents. Um, so I actually had to make up. I had to deal with my mother because I was going to residency college, which my mother had gone to and my grandfather, my dad had gone to. And she was. I was also quite young, so she didn't really want me to go away to America. Um, she knew how keen I was, so we had this deal that um, she basically selected a few universities and said, I know these universities because I've either studied there or I've taught there. And if you get into one of these four, then you can go. Otherwise, you have to stay. And, you know, as rebellious as I was, I'd never actually really done any taken any big decision that was against something that my mother wanted me to do. So that's the agreement we reached and uh, and we honored. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of those things are true. I think it's it's a real shock uh, for parents um, when the daughters that they have made into the daughters that they are talk back. You know, I remember my father saying, "How can you do this? That's like, but you taught me how to do exactly this." You know, that is so true. Um, so yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a good little um, you know. I mean, I, I find that even with my eight-year-old that uh, I'm, sure I'm always know. encouraging her to ask ask questions, right? But I'm so exhausted by her questions. <laughs> yeah. I wish she wouldn't question everything, but I would never say that to her because I'm the one who constantly says, ask, ask, yeah. ask, ask, question everything, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I completely hear you. Okay, I'm good to... Um, Skip a little bit of what we had planned, Nandana. I, I want to um, share some of um, our most favorite poems of hers. And I want to, sh I want to show this range um, of her work. Um, and I, uh, shall we start with Reflection, which we both are so fond of? It's on page 88. Yes. Um, these are shorter uh, poems. Um, but each one has such a distinct mood and such a distinct flavor. So, um, yes, and it's also so different from the, some of the earlier poems that we've already read. Uh, this is actually from her last complete collection of, uh, not collection, a new, new uh, book of poems, which is this one, Tumi Monastir Korum. Reflection. In an empty room at a lonely table, my reflection in the glass whispers, how are you, Nobunita? In an even softer whisper, the steam from my cup of tea sends the secret reply. When we were uh, talking earlier, mm -hmm. I was telling you that I really felt that this was like a haiku almost for the strength of its Im images, the con you know, the condensed tight. Um, nature of such, such, um, um, you know, such a powerfully constructed image, which is actually about steam and a whisper, you know, um, ephemeral um, um, things. 
Um, and questioning herself, yes. Um, as always, I, as always. Yeah, you know, she, she sort of sets herself forward and then she steps back from it. And that, I think, is the, really the, the compulsion of her poems. You know, the backward forward between anguish, defiance, like, I know who I am, you don't know who I am, you know? Yeah. Right. And but a very wonderful observation that it's very high. Like, you know, she, as you mentioned earlier, she was very committed to translating women's poetry from India, from across India and across the world. And she actually published a book of her translations of haiku uh, as well in the last um, in, in, in the last few years. And she was very drawn to it as a form and something about this observation that you made, how many of her poems have. Uh, the, the the heart of the poem is in the last line uh, is is something that um, became even more of a feature of her poetry in her later uh, in her later years and her poems became short shorter, shorter and they were they were very different in in feel uh, and form than her earlier poems um, but you know she translated from Japanese, she translated from Hebrew, she translated from Chinese, from Russian, she translated, of course, in India from uh, about, you know, 15 languages. So she was just really, uh, she was very committed to exploring and learning from forms uh, that she discovered as a, as a writer rather than her own kind of what she grew up with. Yeah. And I know, um, again, from your introduction, that she translated the work of many Indian women poets into Bangla. Right? She, I, I that, that is activism. Let us know what our sisters are saying. You know, whatever language they may be speaking, in, we will understand the experience. Um, exactly. Yeah. She was she a remarkable person. Yeah, yeah. And she did actually her last book uh, of poetry, I mean, the last book of poetry that uh, has her name on it is a book of translations of uh, poetry from across the world um, called Shara Prithivir Kovita, poems mm. from all the world. And it came out just a month after she she passed away. So yes, this was a, uh, and she absolutely believed that bringing women's voices uh, together through translation was a way of uh, embracing solidarity and, and understanding how united we are and how free we could be. Yeah, I, it's, it always shocks me how solidarity is a word that has fallen out of use. It's become archaic as if, you know, the idea itself is no longer relevant to the world we live in. But that's another political discussion. Shall we read House the Color of Pain? Shall we read House the Color of Pain? Another one of my favorites. It's page uh, 66. Yes. yes. Dukho bari. The house has become the color of pain. I can't return to that house again. Turn the boat around, wind of my heart. Blow to a different land, to another part. This is also from... Um, from Make Up Your Mind, that book, which I actually did a translation of as a surprise birthday present for her 75th birthday year. I'll show yes. that to you as well. Yeah. Uh, at, again, another to go on the cover. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've always loved yeah. that one. It's so sad. I mean, how many words does it have? 16, 20, maybe? It's like a shloka, no? And that's 